The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode 111. Captain DeBridge, Spock here. Make it so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the Star Trek Discovery first season episode, Sivis Pachem Parabellum. Joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, although you're using a Latin rather than, or an Italian rather than Latin pronunciation there, but okay. I, I can't help it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's who I am. <laughs> and Father Cory Stiga. Hi, Father Cory. How's it going? Very well. Folks, remember to like The Secrets of Star Trek on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Media. Follow us on Twitter at SQPN. Retweet the episodes there. And leave us comments. Engage with us on social media. We love to extend this relationship that we have with you through the podcast into the social media to those one-on-one interactions. We love to uh, gather with a community of listeners. So uh, we're talking about Siva's Pachem Parabellum, which is a... It was This was the first season of Discovery... 2017. So uh, as we record this, we're three years later. Um, and the the basic plot is Discovery has has been given the job, uh, a high priority mission to go to the planet Pavo and learn, and, and it's going to help them track the Klingon's cloaking devices uh, that using yeah. the, the natural qualities that they, of this planet, some, some particular qualities of this planet has. Although the title doesn't seem to be especially closely related to what happens in this episode. Yeah, I was going to mention that. So the title is Latin for, if you want peace, prepare for war, essentially. Yeah, which is a, a uh, classic, I mean, that's a statement from classical anti- antiquity. And it's certainly true. If you want to have peace, you want to be able to have enough defense. You want to be prepared enough for a war that nobody thinks to attack you. Right. The uh, flip side of that is if, it, which is another a variant of the saying, is if you want war, prepare for peace. <laughs> right, right. Hmm. That's a, a cynical version of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Publius Flavius Vegetius Vegetius Renatus, who wrote in uh, De Re Militari in the fourth or fifth century, uh, although the actual phrasing is "igitur qui desiderat pacem, preparat bellum." Uh, the conditions of peace are often preserved by a readiness to make war when necessary. So, uh, and as you said, Jimmy, not sure how that <laughs> applies here. I mean, maybe the aliens, the Pavans, this is the the lesson for them. Uh, it will, but we'll they have to don't figure learn this it in this episode. No, they don't. Nope. Uh, so we have a, a Star Trek on a Planet episode, first one of Discovery, really, um, because the network, CBS, decreed they needed to visit a planet and get off the ship because Star Trek visits strange new worlds. <laughs> and, nope. and they hadn't been doing that, uh, which I think is a good point. I think Discovery got better in the second episode when they started going places and they weren't just on the ship having these, mm. you know. Uh, second season. Inter- yeah, yeah, right. In the second season. And even in the, I think in the second half of the first season, they don't do much off the ship either, although nope. that's a whole nother uh, ball of wax. But. Yeah, they, like Star Trek visits places. Yes, we have bottle episodes where we're on on ships, but they also have to go places. And I, so I, I, no, I think no that's... bottle seasons is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So the episode starts in media res in the middle of a, a battle. Discovery is a uh, leaping into it's doing its um, mycelial network leap into uh, a battle to save a Starfleet ship being attacked by. Six cloaked Klingon ships. The Gagarin. Um, the Gagarin, yes, uh, named after the Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're, they're just discovering 
the tactical advantage that the brand new cloaking device gives the Klingons, including the fact that they can't fire at them until the cloak drops and they can get a target lock. And they lose. And they lose. Although I, I do want to kind of bring up, wasn't the first time we ever see a cloaking device in Classic Trek when the Romulans had it in Balance of Terror? Yes. And the Klingons only got it after that. Yeah, though they never established on camera that the Klingons got it from the Romulans. Mm -hmm. Because if we accept this as canon, which I guess we're going to have to, is the Balance of Terror was not the first time Starfleet actually encountered cloaking devices. Right. So Klingons have apparently had them. They've had them for a long, or at least had them in the distant past when the sarcophagus ship was made. I think it's an ancient ship. Uh, that Takuma to found, yeah. and yeah. and now the, the current incumbent, Cole, is uh, sharing cloaking technology with the houses that swear fealty to him. Right, right. Uh, it's interesting that they decide that with Discovery, they decided to kind of ignore that bit of canon and, and go with their new way of doing well, things. Wait, wait, I don't think Discovery, Discovery ignores canon? That doesn't happen <laughs> anywhere else. I don't, I don't think they're ignoring canon here. I think they're ignoring fanon that fans decided that this was the first time we'd seen cloaking technology or that the Klingons got it from the Romulans. That's never on screen. Um, uh, well, the way they react in Balance of Terror is a clo cloaking was, was new to them. Like the idea that a ship, hmm. they couldn't see the ship. Um, I, I don't I'd know have if they to go back and watch it again. Yeah, then, yeah, I'd have to. Watch I mean, it again. you could probably head candidate of this first time they've seen the Romulans have it or something. Who knows? Right, right, right. I mean, but well, that, in that, any that case, would, again, that would be head cannon. That wouldn't be actual in script. Actual, that's true. That's true. Um, in any case, uh, as you said, Jimmy, the the Gagarin gets damaged enough so that it can't warp away from the battle. Can't get away. There are too many Klingons, and it's destroyed. Discovery can't save it, and they have to jump away to save themselves. Um, and when they do, after they you know black alert jump, uh, Stamets comes out of the spore chamber and he's disoriented and says to Tilly, "What are you doing down here, Captain?" And as we'll find out later, what he's seeing is the mirror universe, Captain Tilly. So this is where Stamets is starting to get that blurring of the lines between the universes and his self in both universes that will be brought up explicitly later in the season. He's also back to being grumpy Stamets. Yes, which Tilly notices. <laughs> He's no longer high, high on life Stamets. That has moved to Saru. So <laughs> Star, uh, the Starfleet Admiral, the Vulcan Starfleet Admiral, is, is briefing Lorca, telling Lorca that the, uh, the ship of the dead, the sarcophagus ship, their cloaking technology, is, as I mentioned, is now being offered to any Klingon house will offer fealty. And and we are told that Discovery had interrupted a mission that they'd been sent on to, to, to go rescue Gagarin unsuccessfully. They had been on a mission to Pavo, where Burnham, Saru, and Ash, uh, Tyler, are um, they're there to use a natural antenna on the planet to detect cloaked ships at a distance, uh, you know, in, throughout the sector. Right. Uh, everything on the planet vibrates to a unique sound and unique frequency so they're saying everything <laughs> on a planet has a resonant frequency that's right. every planet dude right right but this, well, this makes... particular one goes off into subspace or something so that it can be used as a subspace sonar basically and it's audible that's that's the thing is that it's it it makes a planet-wide audible music that it that it you know, like you said broadcast into space through the jack and the beanstalk yeah so now we're on the blue hippie spore planet Yes. And this episode becomes basically a remake modded version of the original series episode, This Side of Paradise. And This Side of Paradise is the one where they go to uh, an Earth colony and everybody should be dead, but they're not because they're under the influence of these spores that make them all real trippy and lethargic. So this is itself a remake of the Odyssey's Island of the Lotus Eaters. <laughs> it also was a uh, a problem play episode of Star Trek about drug culture in the 1960s. Right. It does, though, have one of my favorite lines. So it, it's famous for it's the one where Spock, after getting spored, he falls in love with the beautiful blonde woman. And it's the yep. one time in original Trek we actually get to see Spock being really, really happy. 
And then Kirk has to snap him out of it by racially insulting him and making him mad so that he loses the influence of the spores. And that turns out that's how you get out from under the spores in that episode is you make people mad. But it does have one of my favorite lines. There's a moment where they're on the planet in this farming colony and Kirk has noticed there are no there are no farm animals. And he views this as incredibly suspicious. And he turns to the leader of the colony and says, why are there no farm animals? And the reply is, we're vegetarians. <laughs> <laughs> that seems very suspicious. <laughs> yeah. So um, for some reason, sensors just work, by the way. Uh, don't ask how, but uh, they, just, they just do. They, they're able to sense things. Um, but uh, the transmitter, the, you know, I mean this with regard to um, how they're going to use this antenna to detect cloaked vessels throughout the sector. No, they don't actually tell us how this is going to happen, but well, apparently they tell it does. us they tell us they're going to modify its signal, and that'll let them decloak the ships or let them see the ships that are cloaked. Yeah, but as as we said uh, last time, uh, with clo- uh, sensors just work. <laughs> mm-hmm. So. Yep. Uh, the transmitter's interference meant that they had to beam down 30 kilometers away and hike two days. Um, does it also interfere with shuttles? Because I, I am sure that Discovery mm. has a shuttle that could have landed them right next to it. But um, okay. <laughs> that gives us a reason to have them walking. Uh, but as they're walking, a, a Pavan native, uh, this sort of gaseous creature, coalesces in front of them and, and wants them to go with it. And Saru is in charge of this away mission. Uh, decides to go. They don't actually have much of a choice, it appears. We also get some background about um, about the Kelpians, because mm-hmm. Saru, I mean, we know that he's a prey species, because that's been established. And we know that they're afraid their whole lives because they're a prey species. That's how they survive, is by being afraid. We get some more detail here, though, in that their senses are much more acute than human senses, which is how they detect danger. And so the planetary resonant frequencies are really messing with Saru in a way they're not messing with Burnham and Ash. Also, because they're a prey species, they run really fast, which is the typical prey strategy for how to survive. You know, it's you run, you're good at running. Right. I mean, here on Earth, you know, you like zebras. Okay, what do they do when a lion comes around? They run. That's how they survive. Run or hide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Saru is like, except for you human slowpokes, I could be at the transmitter in 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got Ash and uh, Michael. Burnham. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you've got Ash and Michael talking about Kelpians. And Burnham is explaining, well, Kelpians do this and Kelpians do that to Ash. And Saru is, and we especially enjoy being discussed in the third person when we're present. But <laughs> but I think that's a little unfair. I mean, if you've got someone who doesn't understand them, I mean, you could say Kelpians or you could say Saru's race or something like yeah. that. But I wouldn't be offended. I mean, if I was, if because she's complimenting them. You know, yeah. yes. And if I was like in some now we don't have other species here on Earth, but we do have other nationalities. And if I was in a group of people and one of them was explaining, oh, Americans are really energetic, optimistic people. I wouldn't be offended by that, even though they're referring to my nationality in the third person ish. I suppose yeah. they're trying to establish that um, Saru is really irritated. He says that the constant noise because his his hearing is so sensitive. Mm. Is really getting to him, which you, I could I could understand that the constant yep. noise, like, like human beings who have are constantly exposed to ultrasonic frequencies mm-hmm. can become irrational and well, uh, angry and that sort of thing. And like maybe they're trying to establish a little bit of that. Hmm. I mean, have, uh, having been living in a house where six months out of the year we've got a boiler pump running constantly, I can understand this completely. <laughs> it's very noisy in my my now former rectory, but. It, yeah, yes. during, yeah, I can understand how he feels because there's times during the winter where I'm just like, can I just shut this thing off and freeze? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the B plot of this episode has to do with uh, Klingons. Uh, Admiral Cornwell, we remember, is, was captured by the Klingons, being held by Cole on the Ship of the Dead, the, the sarcophagus. Laurel meets with Cole there and pledges her house loyalty and offers her services as 
interrogator of Admiral Cromwell, uh, or Cornwell, not Cromwell. Cornwell. <laughs> Cromwell was a different person. Yes, yes, the, my Lord Crom- Cromwell. Uh, they uh, and uh, Cole is suspicious. I think is uh, of of Laurel. Meanwhile, back on Pavo, the the Pavan has taken uh, the the away team to a the, hut, the wigwam drug den. Yes, which why do energy form species need a physical hut? Is, you know to mm-hmm. keep the rain off. I don't know, uh, but they have a hut, the a drug, a an opium den. <laughs> the Saru begins first contact protocols to begin communication. I do like that they they talk about like there are certain protocols you have to follow, certain ways you have to begin communication. Um encounter and, and Burnham explains to Tyler when you encounter an unexpected higher life form on the planet, it means you can't you're no longer set to they they thought there were no higher life forms on the planet. So now they can't just alter or borrow their yeah. property you can't without them agreeing. Take, yeah, you can't just take their stuff. Yeah. So, um, and, and this, she specifically says it's not about the prime directive because we're beyond that now, which I'm not sure why. I thought the prime directive. No. So she explains the prime directive means, at least at this point in time, that we can't reveal ourselves to people who don't yet have warp drive. Well, as far as we know, they don't have warp drive, but we already done revealed ourselves. So, I mean, they came up to us in the forest. So we're, we, we prime directive is over. Now it's about first contact, and we can't just take their stuff and modify their big spooky beanstalk transmitter. Okay. So uh, back on the, the Klingon ship, Laurel has now uh, gone to Cornwell's cell and gets her to scream convincingly to, to get the guard to stop listening, to, to think that she's now being tortured, uh, so they can talk in private. Uh, and so we, we're supposed to you know, ex- question. Is this part of the interrogation strategy? Build a rapport, you know, get on her side, or is Laurel really doing something underhanded? So this is the question because we know she's already uh, been um, underhanded with Cole in the past; that she's not really on his side. So um, there may be something underhanded going on here. Yeah. Meanwhile, back on the Blue Hippie Drug Planet, Ash and yes. Burnham are having a date, and they kiss. Yes, uh, and Ash is trying to talk about his plans after the war to go to Lake Shasta to go camping and fishing, um, and uh, which apparently he has some fake memory of. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's pretty pretty detailed memories that uh, that Ash has been given here. Uh, and uh, Burnham reveals that, well, first that she's never gone camping and fishing. I think is what she says. Uh, but also, she reminds him that her future after the war is prison. She's still got a life sentence ahead of her. Um, and that's when he says, well, then we should keep the war going. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, you know, it's how romantic. Nice line. Millions yes, of people she, die just so you get to stay out of prison. Yeah, but but she rebuts that with the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And that's when we have the uh, the kiss. Yeah. Which is, you know, so romantic. Tilly, meanwhile, it confronts Stamets in the uh, in the the mess hall. Oh, uh, and I about love his... I love his response. I mean, first of all, he tells her to go away, and she won't. He even orders yes. her to go away, and she defies the order, which is very <laughs> uninsin, unacting, insin like, or whatever she cadet, uncadet like. Yes, but finally, his response to her is, "Oh, guess what? I'm having a psychotic break with reality." I mean, that's basically <laughs> what he says. Not in those words, but yeah, I'm having a psychotic break with reality. That's what's up. Yes. Uh, and I, yeah, I can't he tell says, my husband because it will put him in a bad position. And yeah. Right. Well, like, it, wouldn't he already be in a bad position? I, I didn't buy the whole, what, the, this is why we don't tell Hugh about what's going on. I didn't, like, that it didn't make sense oh, I, to I, me. I, but it, I thought it did. I mean, he's so, he either tells Hugh or not. If he tells okay. Hugh, Hugh then has a decision to make. Does he report it or not? If he does report it, then Stamets gets yanked off the Discovery to go get tested at some facility somewhere, and Discovery loses its ability to do the magical jump drive thing, and thus the war is severely hurt. On the other hand, if he tells Hugh and Hugh does not report him and it comes out later, then he will be in enormous trouble. And so he's yeah. protecting either way. Yeah. I could see where he would think that, but I doubt that he would be pulled from the ship. The, the taking that, that I could see that they would yeah. see the advantage greater than 
the needs of that one man. The, but yeah, but well, I can see where he's the decision. many in this war kind of outweigh <laughs> the needs of the one engineer cranky guy. <laughs> right. So, but uh, he's he says uh, one minute he knows who he is, where he is, who Tilly is, and the next minute that changes. So his mind is switching between the mirror self and his regular self. This is again we'll we'll, we'll come back to this in the second half of the first season. Uh, back on the uh, the the sarcophagus ship, so Lorel tells Cornwell that she wants to defect because Cole has no honor and is betrayed to Kuvma's legacy, and she's all alone now, and she wants Cornwell to take her to Discovery. Yeah, she's all alone, her and her really weird uniform that looks like it's made out of white plastic mother of pearl with a bunch of bent lipsticks on her <laughs> shoulders. It's like really bad 1980s. Sh- Even the shoulder pads in the 1980s were not this bad. They didn't have a bunch well, of bent lipsticks yeah. that look like claws on your shoulders. Worse than the costume in this scene, especially, because they're doing a lot of face close-ups here. The prosthetics are terrible. Like oh, yeah. the facial mm-hmm. prosthetics, they're real. Like you can really see the seams and the lines, even where it's starting to separate from the actress's actual skin. It was really bad. I was surprised at how bad it was. Well, so uh, were the fans in general about the Klingon prosthetics in this series. <laughs> yeah, but but especially in this one. Um, yeah. So uh, back on the Pavan planet, Saru. Um, he says he's still establishing communications, but he's been able to determine that the Pavans are the planet somehow, and this is a place of peace and harmony. And their transmitting into subspace has been their attempts to know and be known by the rest of the universe. He then complains about how his more sensitive senses make the constant auditory stimulation tiring and painful, but says being with the Pavans makes it feel better. So, uh, that meanwhile, that night, while the others yeah. are asleep, he's driven into the night by the pain. Yeah, so this is our invasion of the body snatchers moment where they get you when you're asleep. So <laughs> he's trying to sleep. The others are asleep. He's trying to sleep. He goes out and talks to them and says, Can you make this stop even for a moment? And then they pour creepy, weird looking, oopy goopy stuff into him. And he comes back different in the morning. So this is our invasion <laughs> of the body snatchers moment. <laughs> right. Yes. In, in fact, is it a kind of mind meld or is it something else? Like, um, Because it, it reviews, like you see him kind of reviewing memories of himself and and then seeing stuff about the Federation and the Klingons and all that sort of thing. I, I, so, I kind of got the sense it is kind of the mind meld type of idea where they're they're connecting with his thoughts, his memories and everything yeah. and help cuz cuz he wants the that constant noise to go away. And right. so by by melding with him they're able to block it out from him okay. or harmonize him with it. That's how he describes it or the as other, being yeah. being in harmony. But interestingly, it's not they're not just possessing him because we're going to find out later that there are things he hasn't he's he's like playing both sides to his own advantage. He's not he's not fully communicated everything about Starfleet to the Pavans at this point. He's trying right. to keep some things to himself so that he can have the advantage of feeling good and not feeling fear for the first time in his life. And that's like the most important thing to him. But it's not right. what's most important to the Pavans. Right. And that's a key thing is is that he feels unafraid for the first time ever, and that it it gives him a sort of high. I mean, because I mean, if you can imagine the first time never be having always been afraid, not feeling any fear now, it would make you feel invincible in that sense. So the next morning, he he says, you know, he comes in uh, after the others are awake, and he says, "Oh, I used the Pavan transmitter to contact Discovery," and and he talks about how the, hospitable the Pavans have been, and oh, by the way, uh, why don't you give me your communicators? which they do, and then he destroys them with his hands. Like, he just crushes them, so he's very strong. And then he tells them they have to stay on the planet at the invitation of the Pavans. And he doesn't crush their weapons. No, that seems odd. <laughs> yeah, I would have, I mean, so if, if I was in his position, my first thing would be, hey, uh, as a sign of whatever we need to, you know, put our weapons away, let me have your weapons. And then right. I would destroy the weapons and then worry about the communicators because we've already established Discovery is not in communications range. Right. So they can't. Yeah. yeah. Disarm them first and then deal with the communicators. Right. 
uh, from a narrative viewpoint, I suppose they're trying to convey this idea that he's trying to cut them off from discovery. Oh, they're successfully uh, communicating that <laughs> from a narrative <laughs> right, viewpoint. Right. The, uh, yeah. But I guess possessed people don't always think clearly. Yeah. So uh, given Saru's uh, weirdness, his condition, Ash overrules Burnham uh, and takes command of the mission and orders her to complete their task, even though uh, that would violate the, the protocols regarding the Pavan's ownership of their property. Well, there's a dispute about that because uh, Saru has come back and said the Pavans are willing to let us do anything we want. And and Ash says, yeah, so we can take him at his word. And Burnham is like, hey, he's a little unreliable now. Maybe they didn't actually say that. Right, right. Um, and given the what Saru's subsequent behavior, they probably that you can be probably sure that that was just a ruse to get them uh, in the, into his confidence. Maybe, uh, maybe. But, yeah. By the way, I want to comment on is it? Uh, oh, I'm blanking on the actor's name. Dean Jones. Who plays Doug Saru? Jones. Doug Jones. Doug Jones. Um, yeah. I, I really like his performance while he's under the influence of the spores um, because when people in, in stories like this, when people fall under the influence of whatever, whether they're being possessed or mind controlled or whatever it is, they tend to become zombie like. You know, yeah, and they lose their regular personality, and they just start acting different, like it's a different personality completely. And I find that very uninteresting. I find it much more interesting where they have a human personal or a recognizable personality, whether they're human or not. They have a recognizable personality. It's just like, oh yeah, I've just become convinced of this other agenda now, but I'm still me, right. And so that I find much more interesting. And and we have a little bit of that in the original This Side of Paradise, where they're, they don't simply become drugged out zombies. I mean, a little bit, but not terribly. I, here, I think Saru does even better. Or Doug Jones does even better. He's, I mean, he, he's, he's like a relaxed Saru. He's not yes. like a zombie yeah. here. He's still capable of thinking things through and stuff. My favorite illustration of this is in Deep Space Nine, where Keiko O'Brien at one point get at one point gets taken over by a pa wraith. Yeah. And she has a full ordinary it's she's not Keiko, but she has a full ordinary personality as a pa wraith. She is not a zombie. She's not <laughs> acting weird. She's just on the side of evil now. And and there's a, like a moment where she and O'Brien are together, and O'Brien knows that she's been yep. taken over by a pa wraith, and she's got these chocolates, and she's eating them, and it's like, Miles, you're not really going to let me eat all these, are you? And and the pa wraith, it's the pa wraith talking, but yeah. it's so natural. I mean, you can imagine a wife saying to her husband, oh, you're not really going to let me eat all these, are you? And it's it, And I find that vastly more interesting than just mm -hmm. someone gets taken over and becomes a zombie. Well, and that comes out in this episode where at the end, well, without skipping too far ahead and revealing too much, but but Saru kind of owns his behavior here. He's yeah. like, yeah, the, I was I was altered a bit, you know, uh, b under the influence, but that was still me coming out. All that did was intensify a part of my personality, uh, right. but that was still me. And I, I, you're right, it, it it's it's subtly done, and I, I do like that about this episode. Uh, is is how Doug Jones and the, and and the script let's say you know portrayed that. So uh, back on the uh, the ship of the dead, Laurel and Cornwell are are making their way through the corridors to Laurel's shuttle. Uh, when Cole shows up in the corridor, and so they have to pretend that Cornwell has tried to escape, and they fight until Co Cornwell is knocked unconscious, and they pretend that she's dead, and so Laurel has to drag her off to the room where you store the dead bodies, I guess. And she, um, she finds lots of people she knows in the dead body room. I guess the word for that is the morgue. Yeah. <laughs> and she, and so she vows vengeance against Cole. Right. Well, she, didn't, she didn't know they yeah. were dead because she had said in her conversation with Cole that people, or Cole had said to her, or she said, no, in co a conversation with Cornwell, that people had just disappeared. That right. they'd vanished. Just, right. So her people were being uh, killed, apparently, um, to, to isolate her. Um, so meanwhile, uh, Ash is trying to distract Saru from whatever Burnham is doing by asking, uh, you know, Saru about his new favorite subject. 
Uh, and mm. uh, he says the the story says the Pavans took away his fear. Um, and Ash kind of reveals that, like that he can't get over what the Klingons did to him, and he wants to make them suffer. He's you know he can't get get over his anger. But Saru eventually figures that the title is just trying to stall him for time, and for all. For all this peace and harmony shtick, Saru gets pretty angry at this point. Oh, yeah. No, no more peace and harmony for Saru. He's ticked off, and he starts running. And fast. Uh, Bur- Burnham is at the antenna, and she starts. She connects the device to it and starts connecting with Discovery. But Saru, like, you know, he, running like the wind, comes flying in um, and attacks Burnham and the equipment. And uh, she stuns him with her phaser a couple of times, but he knocks it away from her and 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 this is where she tells him, like, where's your peace and balance now, Saru? Yeah, and um, notice this side of paradise, this is the solution. You take the spore spore high the person who's high on spores and you make them mad and they fall out from under the spore influence. Right. And he tells her, You you keep taking my peace from me. Like he her specifically. Well, no, um, he says you keep taking from me. And I right. think when he's referring initially to Captain Giorgio. Right. And he says, you're not going to take this, meaning his piece, away from him, too. Right. But and of course she, she is. Yeah. Well, and she says, you know, I want peace, too, but no one can have it until the war is over. Like, you, we can't just hide here, you know, in our peaceful little cocoon while the war rages. So I- interesting little note here, by the way. It was Kristen Beyer wrote the script for this, and she said uh, she was on location when they were filming this, this outdoor location. And when these, during the Saru versus Burnham fight, scene on Cambridge, she said she kept humming to herself the combat music from A Mock Time. I have to say, that's what a Trekkie would do. So that was good. So anyway, this is when one of the Povins shows up with Ash. They've transported him, which was kind of a neat little transporter thing. And they they, I guess they chastise Saru for his bringing mm-hmm. violence to yeah. them or something? Yeah, well, no, they're chastising him because he hasn't been frank with them about what the Federation people really want. They don't have a problem with letting the Federation people use their big, giant crystal beanstalk transmitter. Right. So they actually repair the equipment that Burnham had hooked up to it so that they can call the Discovery. And so... This is where it becomes obvious that Saru has been playing both sides to his own advantage. He's apparently been lying to Ash and Burnham, uh, and he's also been lying to the Pavans so he can maintain his spore high. Um, right. Because <clears throat> if the if the Pavans learn about the war and everything, they're like, okay, well, we're, we'll intervene in that. We don't have a problem. And they don't realize at this point how they're going to intervene. But they should be suspicious, because when the aliens are modding their beanstalk transmitter, it's like, wait a minute, these aliens are all about harmony on this planet, and so the harmony aliens aren't pacifists, and they're willing to help the Federation war effort? Right. Really? How does that work evolutionarily? And Saru... uh, says, you know, if the Klingons discover that you've helped the Federation, they'll hurt you too. You know, they, they, he's he's trying to warn them, like, make sh- like if you if you help the Federation, you're putting yourselves in danger. But to no avail, the Pavans activate the antenna, which means Discovery can now be, uh, lock on to the away team and beams beams them up as Saru is pleading to be allowed to stay, uh, which is uh, you know a, a, a affecting moment. Uh, and in sick bay, Burnham talks to Saru, and this is where she says, "Oh, you weren't yourself." But he says, "No, I was. This is this was me without the fear I've known my entire life." And this is going to play out in that in the second season when we find out that the Saru, the Kelpians, are not really a prey species; that they weren't really, but they were adapted and made this way by another race. But uh, so th- this is who Saru is, and his people are when they're not being made uh, into prey. Uh, back on the sarcophagus, Laurel tells Cole that Cor- uh, Cornwell confirmed that Discovery has the jump drive technology, and uh, thus Cole makes her part of his house, despite the uh, Cornwell, in his mind, being dead. Uh, but then he calls her a liar and has her taken away. Um, and I'm not sure why. Is it because he knows Cornwell's not really dead? 
Um, they don't really explain, but he clearly didn't yeah. believe her. He he uh, pretended to believe her and accept her into his house, and then says, "Ha ha, just kidding. You're arrested." Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I I don't remember from watching this three years ago exactly what they do, his... they do eventually. I think if I remember right, they do eventually play that out of what's going on. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. But then at this point, this is when they detect the signal coming from Pavo, which they somehow know is an invitation uh, to come. And so on Discovery, they see that the antenna is not working as expected. Uh, Burnham sees that the Pavans are trying to bring about harmony between the Klingons and Federation, since they're all about peace and harmony. And she said, this is what they should have figured out was happening before. So Burnham says, well, we're the only line of defense put by the Pavans, so we have to stand and fight to defend them. And that's where we end. This is essentially the first part of a multi of a two parter where mm-hmm. they're or going to now uh, the, the, the of, sarcophagus ship. Yeah, it's a, a two parter uh, that ends the the first half of the season. So they did a like a fall part of the season and a spring part of the season. And this is right. This next episode will end that fall part. That's right. That's right. The, one of the things I'm left wondering here, though, is how the Laurel and Cornwell storyline fits with the theme of if you want peace prepare for war does it fit or is this just tacked on to kind of continue a season-long b plot i i don't think any of this really fits particularly well with the title i think they picked the title because it's cool okay yeah uh, you're right i mean maybe it's a lesson for the povins like if, if they really want peace they have to be ready to go to war with the klingons not be pacifists yeah, and try to make peace. Maybe I, I, I think it just it has themes of peace and war, and it expresses a cool sentiment. And they get to talk Latin at the audience, so I think it's <laughs> I think that's why. And continue the tradition of Discovery's first season's long episode titles. Yeah, that have absolutely uh, no meaning whatsoever. <laughs> right, that's true. That's true. Uh, any final notes, Father Corey? Nothing here, Jimmy. Uh, the blue. Hippie drug planet was pretty. I like <laughs> I, I like how yes, they was. use just all they're doing is filming outdoors in in Vancouver or California or wherever Vancouver, and yeah. then using color filtering. So yeah. instead of having a forest that's dominated by normal shades of green, it's got a bunch of blue leaves and stuff like that. But they otherwise look realistic. Yes, yes. Um, I. Re- I do want to add, uh, I remember what, well, first time watching this, thinking that Cornwell was actually dead. I didn't think that, uh, I didn't get that she was knocked out and that she was, I, I I remember thinking that she was then being confused later when she came back. So I'm not sure they, well, it might've been just me, they, but I'm not sure they sold that well enough. No, they wanted, they, 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 wanted, they wanted to yeah. make it look like she was dead. That was the whole point. Okay. Because okay. Laurel even says, I'll dispose of the body. Right, right. And yeah. then she does dispose of the body, and we never see her eyes flicker open. So it, it, as far as the audience knows, she's dead at this point. Yeah. So um, I think that should wrap it up for us here. Um, the, this one, we'll, we'll be getting to the end of that, f- the, the, the half-season finale next time we talk about Discovery. But, uh, but for now, uh, we want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including Dalton H., Hind DP, James M, Rick H, and Adam C. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue The Secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. We'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edits the show for us every week. That's it from us. So what do you think of Sivis Pacem Parabellum? Uh, in my Italian pronunciation of it, let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek or our Facebook page, facebook.com slash starquest media, or send an email to trek at sqpn.com. And we'll be back next time. We'll be talking about the original series episode, Dagger of the Mind. Until then, Father Cory Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thank you, Dom. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thank you, and live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Don Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. Sorry, not this time.